here with Chick Egley, the new brains behind Hemlock Grove. Is it fair to call you that? Brains behind Hemlock Grove? I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm the bald guy behind Hemlock Grove. I got to tell you, I have never in my years of watching TV seen a show change so much in its second season from its first. Would you say that you're responsible for sort of changing the creative vision of the show? Well, I think, um, you know, what happened was that you show up on a show and you bring your per t uh, particular uh, toolbox with you. And, and Evan Dunsky, uh, come, who created Nurse Jackie uh, with a network background, and Peter Blake coming in from House. I, I think when what happened, the writer's room just uh, was all people that had come out of uh, uh, years of experience in, in network television. Uh, and cable TV, and uh, uh, just we just uh, set the tone from the season based on our, our working styles. Was there any pressure to sort of like stick to the norm, don't rock the boat because you're the new kid on the block, or did you have the creative freedom to take it in the direction that you wanted to take it? Well, I think whatever pressure there was was self-imposed. Um, you know, obviously. Um, this, the show last season, Brian McGreevy just set such a lovely table that I got to be a dinner guest at. Um, and we didn't want to come in and just so change the show around that the fans w would be looking at it and going, well, what's this? This isn't my show. Um, you know, I, uh, coming into a, a show that's already up and running, you do so with a great deal of humility and a great deal of respect. Um, so y y whatever you do different because of uh, uh, the sensibility you bring to it, it needs to work in the, con in the context of what's been established. Because television, the great thing about TV is that um, you have to deliver on expectation. You've made a pact with the audience that, that they tune in expecting to, to see something uh, specific. Um, you know, going back, way back, you know, Bruce Willis uh, on Moonlighting. It's like people tuned in because they wanted to see that, you know, wise-ass, you know... Uh, 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 Smart alecky. Yeah, yeah, and his, his sort of wordplay and stuff like that. So you need to deliver on expectation. And we didn't want to let the audience down. Obviously, you have a lot of experience. We talked a little bit before about Murder One, Dexter, Walking Dead. Would you say that that experience influenced you in terms of the violence that characters choose to employ on a show like this? Well, certainly, um, you know, past this prologue, uh, a any show that I've worked on influences me uh, uh, enormously. Uh, the Shield, for example, uh, the density of storytelling in that show. Um, that really changed my style of writing. There was just so much story that was crammed into, you know, we, we used to say 15 pounds of story in a five pound bag. Um, that shaped my sensibilities, which I then brought into this show. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of violence, um, you know, again, thinking about it in the abstract, you know, the abstracted notion of violence uh, isn't really the way I approach story. Um, any more than I think of this as a, as a horror show, per se. I don't really know anything about the tropes of horror. Um, the, there are characters who do horrific things, they witness horrific things, but all of that needs to come out of uh, an emotional context, a character context, uh, uh, those moments have to be earned. Um, just, you, you don't wanna just have sort of gratuitous uh, moments of, uh, of, of, you know, gore or spectacle just because you can, it, it, you know, it's, uh, uh, you, you have to really earn that. It's got to come out of some emotional truth for somebody. I love the idea of the flawed protagonist, you know, and I feel like we got that with Dexter. And while I feel like Peter is obviously the flawed protagonist of Hemlock Grove, I almost feel like in the second season, we see elements of the hero in Roman as well. Was that a conscious decision to sort of present both sides of Roman? Well, people are necessary. I mean, they, the, a human being is a, a, a flawed being. It, it, it's, it's the human condition is to be flawed. And so if you're writing truthfully, you're going to really be writing uh, about a character, w warts and all. I think the way 
that really came to the fore was through Stephen Bonchko's work. Um, I'm thinking uh, back to Hill Street Blues, um, which obviously reverberated through the culture of cop shows afterwards, NYPD Blue, and, and certainly The Shield. Um, the idea of just a sort of a monochromatically uh, gleaming protagonist, um, it just isn't all that interesting. It's not interesting to write about. It's certainly not that interesting to watch. Uh, so uh, watching a character sort of make accommodations with their flaws uh, is it, just so interesting. It's, it's the essence of what it is to be human. One of the big moments in the second season uh, starts off right away with the reconstruction of Olivia's tongue. And I understand that you actually had a lot of experience with this because one of your friends had his tongue. Is that what it was? Yes. Uh, I have a friend who uh, I hadn't seen in quite a while. And uh, we had lunch in Los Angeles. And he uh, told me that the reason I hadn't seen him is that he uh, had been diagnosed with cancer and had gone through just this really arduous experience. He had cancer of the tongue, non-smoker, interestingly, and they removed his tongue to save his life. Um, he, what The musculature of the tongue apparently is very similar to the abductor magnus, if I'm butchering that medical term, oh, yeah. anatom anatomical term, um, is similar in its structure to the tongue. So they harvested a donor portion of muscle from the, the uh, thigh and then fashioned a tongue out of it. So he had to learn how to talk all over again. And he had to teach his thigh how to taste. <laughs> really? Yeah, because it, the, the uh, uh, link between uh, what happens here and what happens here, it's, you know, it's all about what happens here. So you've got to get basically your thigh on the same page as your brain. Um, do, do you feel like not having to restrict yourself to the book, you know, that's a big thing with season two, you know, there's not this pressure that, oh, fans are going to be mad if we don't do this or if we don't stick to this chapter in the book. Did that help or hurt you in terms of the freedom that you had in creating this new story? Well, I've, I've never uh, felt the need to be governed by source material. Um, on Dexter, you know, when I came into that show, um, they'd used up the book, I guess, in the first couple of seasons. I never read the book. Um, it seemed to me that what it did was to launch a character and, and a sensibility. Um, and then you do what storytellers do. You, you uh, tell stories. You make up stories. Uh, I've not read uh, Brian McGreevy's book, and I apologize to Brian uh, uh, for a reason. I, I wanted to just be, you know, kind of keep it hermetically pure reacting to the characters that he created last season. So, um, uh, no, I'm not intimidated the fact that there's no underlying source material. Finally, I felt like the first season of Hemlock Grove really celebrated the outrageousness, you know, like you never really knew what was going to happen from one episode to the next. I feel like the second season is really character driven. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, Anything that happens, again, my training, and, and uh, it goes back to MTM, and I seem to be mentioning Stephen Bonchko a lot today. Um, one of the things that he always harped on was, you know, the logic of human behavior. You can't um, just construct a scene because you want to. I mean, you, unless you've earned that emotionally and unless it adheres to the logic of human behavior, you sort of hear the typing. Uh, uh, you, you see the shadow of the writer on the wall is an expression we used to use uh, at Moonlighting. So it really, we, you know, we just have to get inside the heads of these characters and figure out, you know, uh, if I were Roman, you know, what what would I do? Uh, the exigency of need in episode one when Peter, uh, you know, his mom's in jail. Roman won't give him any money. Uh, what does he do? Well, what does he have? What is it? What what does he have to work with? You know, it's a little like Apollo 13, you know, where they had to, okay, this is what we've got up here. This is the gear we've got. What can we make out of it? Well, yeah. people sort of do that. Um, this is my lot in life, this is my situation, how can I put it together to achieve what I want? 
And finally, I got to give a plug to my friends at Netflix. When you're writing for a show like Netflix, is it liberating where you don't have to write like cliffhanger, cliffhanger endings or like a throw to a commercial break? You can just focus on the story. Yeah. Um, you know, McLuhan was really right that the, the, the medium, um, you know, shapes the content absolutely. And uh, I've watched the progression in my career starting out in broadcast television which is advertiser supported so you've got to uh, um, you know get everybody up to speed from last week um, you've got to at the end of the first act you've got to go out on some act out that will get people to come back from the commercial um, and and, uh, and then the sort of a cliffhanger at the end that gets you to the next episode so people will come back next Thursday night you're freed from that it's just taken away from you um, you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to worry about the recapitulation of story to get people up to speed on... Um, you know, the thing about the procedural shows that work so well is that I, I know my daughter uh, is watching uh, one of the procedurals on Netflix now, and they're standalone. She can pick it up anytime, anywhere, and, and immerse them herself right into the story. Um, the great thing about writing for uh, Netflix is you've got an extremely literate television audience. They they really know the world, they know the characters, so uh, you can assume uh, a, lev a level of uh, familiarity with the culture of the show, which allows you to just get deeper into the show. The old saw was uh, a network show would ha have, uh, you know, the characters talking about what they're going to do. You see them go out and do it. Mm -hmm. Then they come back and talk about what they just did. So the audience, there's an accessibility factor. The audience can jump in anywhere and not feel like they've missed something. Uh, you really have to know what's going on um, in Hemlock Grove. And actually, just further to that question, may I? You know, it was one of the problems uh, back when this the, I think probably the original archetype of this kind of serialized storytelling um, was Murder One. The network was extremely concerned that if somebody missed an episode, they weren't going to come back for the rest of the season. Um, so in year two, we uh, the first episode, uh, first season, uh, excuse me, what, the first season of uh, Murder One was 23 hours about one murder trial. Yeah. The second season, again, to make the show more accessible to a network audience, was, well, let's break it up into seven episodes, three arcs of seven episodes, so people wouldn't feel like they were intimidated. Uh, that they, they uh, um, you know, I can't watch that show because I didn't see what happened last week. And again, as we were saying earlier, appointment television back then was somebody somebody who was a regular viewer of a television show maybe saw five episodes a season that was before the culture of I'll buy the box set which Netflix emulates in the the binge viewing thing now now people don't tune in to watch one episode of Hemlock Grove if if you're in for a penny you're in for a pound and, and I want to end with um you know, the show films in Ontario, so I have an idea for you for a potential season three. Are you ready for it? Absolutely. Okay. I love anything Ontario-based uh, I, I, I want to write toward. My, my wife is from Ontario. My kids are. Okay, so what do you think about this? You have a Kenyan-Canadian reporter who's very good-looking, and he tries to find out the story about Vargulfs. You know, he's trying to just answer what's happening in Hemlock Grove. All of a sudden, it turns out that he's the dragon in the Order of the Dragon. What do you think? Not that I'm suggesting anyone for the part or anything. You already have a day job. You can just say it's a bad idea, Chick. I, I won't take it personally. There are no bad ideas. <laughs> um, a bad idea is uh, simply an idea that you follow until it takes you to a good idea. I'm holding him to that. Chick, thank you so much. Stay tuned for a scene from Hemlock Grove, Season 2. You're my flesh and blood. What about Shelly? Have you even thought of her once since she disappeared? You think I haven't grieved? What about my family? You wanted me to kill my own daughter. I knew you'd never do it. It was the only way for you to progress. I don't want to progress. I want to be human. It's never an option. 
I am Upir. I'm your mother. I would give anything! Anything. Not to be your son.